Well, good evening. Welcome back for our evening time of worship together. And I am thankful you're all here. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm excited to worship with you tonight as we celebrate his death and resurrection and uh, rejoice in his kindness towards us. Um, I want to begin tonight by telling you about a book of the, it'll be our book of the month. I will promote it next Sunday. Uh, we have 200 copies of them in the bookstore at a better price than Amazon, I, I'm told, and it was recently verified. So don't just go home and buy it on Amazon, but buy it from the bookstore. Uh, and then I will um, let the whole congregation know on Sunday. So you have tonight to get it before the, the stampedes. Um, so the book is God versus Government by Nathan Business and James Coates. And it is an exceptional book. Uh, it, is, it is just really good. Not that I ever promote a mediocre book, that this is, but this is even better than most of the books uh, that, that I promote. I really encourage you to get it. It was a fast turnaround on this book. It just, I mean, it's released March 1st. So even tonight, it's, we were pre-release date uh, that, we, that we have these. Um, so it is the story of the first third of it is the story of Grace Community Church in Los Angeles and their lawsuits uh, and their conflict with the governor of California and particularly the county of Los Angeles uh, and their thought process. It's kind of the firsthand account of why the church closed at the beginning of COVID restrictions, why they uh, opened up uh, around Memorial Day and why they then stayed open even though the county um, took them to court in order them to, to close uh, for a while. Grace was one of just a handful, maybe three or four churches in California uh, that were, uh, or in LA County that were open during this time. And the county brought the full force of the law down on all those churches that were open. And the Lord providentially allowed the church to stay open through that time uh, through different lawsuits and court rulings and back and forth. This is a kind of a firsthand account of that to let you know what the elders of the church were thinking and how they were experiencing it from, from their own side. Then the next third of it is by James Coates, and he's the pastor in Canada. Uh, his church also uh, stayed open during COVID, and the government came after them as well. And what's striking as you read these two accounts is how similar they are. Uh, James James Coates, if you remember, ultimately ended up going to jail for, for a long period of time. Um, and it just, you know, he writes this, that third, and he describes uh, what was going on in his life, his family, and his church that led him to those decisions and led him to jail. Just some kind of gripping scenes in it. Even though when he's brought before the, the judge, the, the magistrate there, whatever, the Canadian version of that is, uh, they weren't expecting him to go to jail. Uh, they offered him a, the bail release form. I mean, even the officer who took him to jail uh, you know, was offering to give a ride home after the, the court hearing. Uh, they thought he would just stand before the judge and sign his uh, bail release because everybody signs their condition of release form. That's what everybody does because nobody wants to go to jail. Um, so the condition of release is that you abide by the laws uh, during your release. And they made clear that the law was that, his, that he would not preach um, during that time. His church could remain open, but he would not be able to preach because he was the one signing it. And, uh, and he declined uh, and said that he wouldn't uh, submit himself to that. And they didn't know what to do. They were kind of frozen there. So it's a really interesting account. And the Lord uh, used him when he was in jail in different uh, ministry capacities. What struck me reading those two thirds of the book is the difference between what happened in Los Angeles and what happened in Canada. It was not uh, legal. It was not like the legal threshold was different in those two places. And that's why a Canadian pastor went to jail and not John MacArthur. Uh, it was entirely providential. The rules and the structure, authority structure in both places were the same. The laws were essentially identical. Uh, it was just the way um, the case was appealed in California and the, the judges that heard that went in a different direction, didn't want to throw MacArthur in jail, whereas the judge in Canada did. Um, so it, it struck me with a fresh sense of, uh, of God's providence reading this, and I would encourage you to read it. And then finally, the last third of it is biblical principles to guide those decision-making uh, capabilities. I have said this before. I've preached uh, on this last November in December. Uh, I did four sermons Sunday night on this, but um, the idea that is often heard in evangelicalism, that you obey God at all times unless, uh, I mean, you obey the government at all times unless the government commands you to sin. That's the way I think most evangelicals would articulate that doctrine. And I think that's just not true. I think it's a woefully inadequate articulation of that doctrine um, because that's a level of allegiance that's only owing to God. Uh, the truth is the Bible commands you to obey lawful 
commands. That's from the Westminster Confession. Uh, instructs it that way, that government is constrained by natural law, is constrained by God's law, and the government, when they exceed their boundaries, uh, are not owed allegiance or obedience. And so this book has some principles at the end that make that case, and I think a pretty compelling, compelling way, along with giving you a call to stand um, in your own life, in your own spheres, for righteousness and justice, uh, and the worship of the church to cherish the worship of the church over and above um, the musings of uh, providential lesser magistrates. You know, ju judges that come and go, mayors that come and go, governors that come and go, but uh, the church stands and the gates of hell won't overcome it. So I strongly commend this book to you. Uh, I read it just in probably an hour and a half it took me to read it because I actually I was planning on just reading the first chapter and I just got hooked and I couldn't put it down. So I would encourage you to get it. But I have two copies tonight to give away. Uh, and I will give one copy to somebody. These are the, this is the criteria. First of all, you want to read it. Um, and who wouldn't after my introduction of right there? <laughs> and secondly, you prayed for James Coates while he was in jail. If that's what you are. I see the hand in the white hat. Um, the light is blinding me, so I can't see who you actually are. But I see the white hat. All right. And then uh, one for somebody who wants to read it and who prayed for John MacArthur and Grace Church while they were going through their trial. All right, there you go. <laughs> you know, let me remind you that at as an evening service, we prayed for both of those people repeatedly. <laughs> so I'm just saying, <laughs> did you not say amen afterwards or? <laughs> Let's go to the Lord now even. God, we do dedicate this time to you tonight. And uh, we're grateful for this Lord's Day that you've set it aside in our life um, for us to turn to your word. We love this church. We cherish it. We want to sing about the greatness of the gospel that binds us together, heart to heart, person to person. And we want to look in your word and see what makes the church a special place. Um, we pray the things we see in the word tonight would conform us to the image of Christ who is on display in the church. This is his body, and so we pray that as people look at his body, uh, they, would see, they would see him. We want you to be on display through our gathered worship tonight. Just as there is one God, there is one Savior, one baptism, one faith. And so we present that truth tonight through one body gathered together, uh, the visible means of grace, the incarnate uh, church, the gospel made visible through our gathering tonight. We dedicate this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand, if you would stand together and grab your hymnal and turn to him number four as we enter into his presence and praise his name. Oh, people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Serve him with fear, his praise forth tell. Come kneel before him and rejoice. For God is Lord of heaven and earth. He gave us breath by his command. We are the Sweet. 
number 46, it is such a grace gift of God that we can come before him uh, to worship him. And this song reminds us that our salvation is not a result of works so that no one may boast. So let's sing now of this great grace we have been given. No list of sins I have not done. No list of virtues I pursue. No list of those I am not like can earn myself a place with you. Oh God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner through and through. My only hope of righteousness is not. song, no recitation of the truth can justify a single wrong. My righteousness is Jesus' life. My debt was paid by Jesus' death. My weary home was born by Him, and He alone can give Open your Bibles for a scripture reading tonight to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If it sounds familiar, I don't believe we read it on our evening service, but we did read it Sunday morning. I think two weeks ago. So I want to read it again tonight, just in the flow of 2 Corinthians. And uh, it fits so much with what uh, we've been mentioning uh, in our sermons recently about um, well, not only Paul's suffering, but the way the devil attacks us as an angel of light. So it's interesting to see how they're paired together as we read it tonight. 2 Corinthians 11, Paul says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Oh, do bear with me. For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure, pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, so your thoughts will be led astray by sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit than the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel than the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I'm not the least inferior to these super apostles, even if I'm unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way, we've made this plain to you in all things. 
Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you for free of charge? I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I didn't burden anyone. For the brothers that came from Macedonia supplied my needs. So I refrained and I will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I don't love you? God knows I do. And what I do, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do accept me as a fool so that I may boast a little. What I'm saying with this boastful confidence I say not with the Lord's authority, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being so wise yourselves. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I was adrift at the sea on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from all the other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Who is made to fall and I'm not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. I feel bad stopping there. It's kind of in the middle of his tirade, but we'll pause it until next week. Let's pray. Lord, this kind of chapter reading it, of course, gives us mixed emotions. We can't help but laugh at some of Paul's language, um, his logic that Christians so easily can believe fools and can believe folly and endure with false teaching. And so we kind of chuckle at Paul pretending to be a fool and so that fools would listen to him. And on the other hand, we are sad reading this. We can, through the sarcasm and through the self-depreciation, we can see Paul's hurt. We can see his heart behind all this, that he's grieving, and that people whom he loved and that he made tremendous sacrifices to minister to have so quickly turned against him. I think back to Paul describing his own need we don't know what his need was, but certainly he was desperate, perhaps for food or shelter. And yet his relationship with the Corinthians was so strained, he wouldn't even go to them to ask for help. We're thankful to you, O oh God, that in your providence you provided people from Macedonia and other servants of Christ to minister to Paul in his need. We're thankful for his sufferings, which seems a strange thing to say to thank you for, but Paul himself in Colossians thanked you for them. And so, so we do as well. We think of the amount of times he was beaten for the sake of the gospel, shipwrecked even, floating in the sea, lost, presuming to die, but this was his, his life. We know from the moment of his conversion, he was persecuted as he even ended this chapter. He, we see him describing 
his first encounter with it, where he's led out the window in Damascus, barely escaping. What a life and legacy that Paul leaves us and the church, and so we're thankful that it's recorded here. We read this and we ask for humility in our own hearts. We pray that we would be humble enough to receive the truth from your word. We pray that we would be discerning enough to see through error. We pray that we would be impatient enough to not put up with the foolishness that's tolerated in, in so many churches, the foolishness of believing false doctrine and the signs and wonders of these so-called super apostles that elevate themselves based on um, fake gifts and really charlatans. We pray that you would give us the courage to oppose them, the boldness to oppose them, the compassion to see the grief and the affliction, the suffering those kind of people cause in the church. They are deceitful. They disguise themselves as servants of Christ when really they're under the influence of demons. Our heart breaks for family members or loved ones, acquaintances that we have that are swept up in those movements. Um, we do pray that their, the scales would fall off of their eyes, that, that you would give them uh, insight into true spiritual truth, that you would rescue them from the clutches of those false prophets, those so-called super apostles, and you would bring them to trust more in your word and less in signs and less in experiences, but more in the unwavering word of God. And Lord, our heart understands uh, Paul's burden as well. I know I do, where he asks who is weak and he is not weak. We know that as pastors and elders, we see weakness in the church and sin in the church, and it hurts our hearts. Uh, it grieves us when we see people we love uh, making sinful choices and bringing harm to their families and harm to their relationships, surrounded by people they love and yet um, causing conflict and strife. Husbands who leave their families and wives that leave their families or sort of mean to their, their kids, and it fills us with grief. We see that kind of sin in the, the church, and we echo Paul's words, who is weak and we are not weak. So would you pray for your grace? Oh God, Father of our Lord Jesus, we pray for your blessing to be on our church, to guard us from that kind of sin, to give us discernment and courage, a love for the truth, a love for people who are walking in the truth, a love for the lost, to call them to the truth. We pray that all those things would mark our own lives as we try to just marvel at the Apostle Paul and his supernatural ministry. We pray that it would be a, moder uh, a model and an example, a motivating influence in our own lives as we seek to bring the good news of Christ to the, the watching world. We pray tonight that you use our time and our word to accomplish that in our own hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand again and... Uh, Grab your hymnals and let's open to hymn number 56. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me
for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus, oh precious is the is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount i know nothing but the blood of jesus oh precious is the himself our salvation. Salvation. Who 
Let's open our Bibles now to the book of Acts, chapter 2, picking up kind of where we, in the same chapter we left off at last week, although we're going to jump over Peter's sermon uh, in the middle of Acts 2. Maybe one day at Lord Terry's, we can get back and look at, uh, look at that sermon more carefully. But I want to jump to the end of the uh, Acts, chapter 2, down to verse 42. Actually, I'll pick, it, I'll pick it up down in uh, verse 41. I'll read, read it for us first. Those who received his words, referencing Peter's sermon, were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done to the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in the homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. If you drive along Braddock Road, you spy the Oakwood School that is under construction right now. It's been under construction for a couple of years. It's been dug up and they laid uh, some pipe down there and they had to dig it back up and the county made them put it down and dig it up. I think it's only like round three there. Uh, they're expanding the building um, and it's just, it's a huge, huge project. You see it probably, uh, some of you I'm sure see it every, every day as you drive by. Uh, what you may not know, some of you may not know, is that that was originally Emmanuel Bible Church. That's where Emmanuel Bible Church started. That was the first building and worship center uh, for the church. Um, church started, I believe, 58 years ago or something like that, um, 1967. So you can do the, the math on that. Uh, in January 7th is when they moved into that. The Church of Emmanuel Bible Church started at Lee High School, but they moved into that as their first building. And you might be interested to know this. You know the Oakwood School I'm talking about, the wood playground outside, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, when Emmanuel Bible Church bought that and built it, the whole thing, property, building, everything, $125,000 total cost. Uh, that's probably how much it's costing them to dig up the pipes right now <laughs> every week to fix those. Um, 
It was the early 1980s when the church moved here to Braddock and Backlick and the church met. Uh, the worship center is now what is the gym. And if you walk over into the gym now, it doesn't look very churchy. It looks very Jimmy, is how I would describe it. Uh, that might not be a technical term. I got to go on a tour of Oakwood School uh, right before they started the construction. Got to walk around the building and check it out. And you could tell, the trained eye could tell that it is a church. As you uh, walk around looking at it, you can, you know, it looks schoolish now. There's lockers and such. There's yearbooks and sport team pictures in the wall. But you walk into what is their gym and you can recognize like that. I'm pretty sure that looks like it was a baptismal over there. Had kind of the wooden backing behind the, uh, the, you know, the basketball courts there. And it had the stage up there that some schools have. And then it had what looks like a baptismal behind it. So I went to investigate that more carefully. And lo and behold, behind a the closet, there are janitor supplies stored in a baptismal. Like so many Baptist churches. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the gym had the architecture of a church, of course. Um, but it's not really a church. It's not a church at all anymore. Um, same with our gym. It raises the question, what makes something a church? Now, you've been around the block enough to know that the church isn't the building. It's the people. You understand that. But chase that down one more step on that road. The church isn't the building. It's the people. Okay, what makes the people the church? Are any two Christians gathered together a church? Are four Christians at Starbucks a church? After all, the Lord said, where two or more are gathered, I'm there with you. Church, take an offering at Starbucks. See what happens. You understand that the church begins prophetically in Matthew 16, where Jesus says, I will build my church. This is a very strong passage that maybe we can look at uh, sometime where Jesus is prophesying the future church. He says that he will build the church when Jesus declares that in Matthew 16. The church does not yet exist. We're going through a series right now, a contrast of covenantalism, dispensationalism. And as I gave you the overview of dispensationalism a few weeks ago, I said you could really boil dispensationalism down to kind of one basic point. The church begins in Acts chapter 2, and it's not Israel. And that's it. And there are some verses that I think teach that quite clearly, Matthew 16 being one of them. Jesus speaks about the church in future terms. I'm going to build it. I will build it on the foundation of Peter and his apostolic preaching, on the foundation of Peter confessing that Jesus Christ is the, the Lord. That becomes the cornerstone. Uh, of course, Jesus himself is the cornerstone, but that cornerstone is made manifest, Titus says in Titus 1, verse 2 and 3, that cornerstone is made manifest through the preaching of the word. And that's what Peter did. And that's what we just uh, skipped in Acts chapter 2 is Peter's sermon that launches the church. Of course, the Holy Spirit comes at the beginning of Acts 2, seals everybody, binds them together into one corporate body. We looked at this last Lord's Day. Now Peter fulfills Matthew 16 by preaching the gospel. People are saved and they are added to the church. This is a new thing. It's starting right here with Jesus as the, the cornerstone. The apostles preaching is the foundation of it. And Jesus is building it like he said he would in Matthew 16. That's what's happening here. This is not the temple system. This is not the synagogue system. The synagogues were not built on the, the foundation or the cornerstone of, of Christ as the Savior. And they certainly were not built on the foundation of apostolic preaching. They predated the apostles. We looked at a few weeks ago, the parable of the, the bloody vineyard, where Jesus spoke against the Pharisees and saying, because of their rejection of, the, of uh, Jesus and his ministry, their rejection that God, the vineyard owner, had sent his son to collect the rents, they rejected him. They would throw him out and kill him. Jesus said that the vineyard would be taken from them and given to others. That's, again, Jesus prophetically describing the foundation of the church that he's building it on Peter's preaching and the apostles. They will be the, the foundations of the beginning. You don't go retrofit a building with a new foundation. If you're going to give it a new foundation, you demo it and you lay a new foundation. And so Jesus describes the apostles' preaching as the foundation of it. And here in Acts 2, we're seeing the church newly gathered. Last week, we saw the first activity of the church as the Holy Spirit came and sealed them and brought them in together. And now we see the church growing dramatically. You know, 100 plus people at the beginning of the chapter and now 3,000 plus people at the end of the chapter. This is church growth. 
This is not the synagogue. It's not the temple system. It's a totally new structure. And it is the church. Now, what makes it the church? I think there's marks here uh, as we go through Acts, the end of Acts chapter 2. There's descriptions of what are the signs of a true church. What makes a church a church? And I'll give them to you tonight. Firstly, a true church has baptism. A church that doesn't have baptism, I would say, is not a church. This is the, how these people are added to the church. If you look at verse 41 of Acts chapter 2, those who received his word, meaning Peter, were baptized. And they were added that day about 3,000 souls. So you see here, baptism is the connection to being added to the church. Those people who were baptized, they were not in the upper room at the initiation of Pentecost. They did not receive the Holy Spirit with the tongues of fire. That wasn't something that happened to them. That was how the church began with the apostles and the early disciples, the 100 plus people in the upper room. They had the tongues of fire. They had the baptism of the Spirit. They were bound together that way. Now you have new people being added to the church. They weren't there on moment one of the church. They came, you know, they weren't part of the launch team, but they came on launch Sunday to use the church planning lingo. And they're now saved. They respond in faith. Now they hear Peter's sermon. The Holy Spirit regenerates them, causes them to be born again, gives them faith. They express their faith in Jesus Christ. They believe Peter's preaching, Peter's confession of Christ as the Savior. They believe it. Now how do they go from that person right there who believes the gospel? Here's this, they're, they're at the physical gathering of the church. They hear the gospel. They believe it. How do they move from that point to being part of the church? And the expression of that is baptism. That's what they did. It was the public demonstration, obviously here, the public demonstration of their own personal conversion. Not everybody who heard Peter's preaching was saved. His word, the external call went out, but the internal working of the Holy Spirit affected 3,000 plus people of that. That day, around 3,000 people, it says. And they expressed their faith in conversion by baptism. Baptism was the mark that brought them into the church. It was the public declaration. They're now identifying with believers. So a true church has baptism. And if you've been to Jerusalem, you've walked around the temple, uh, uh, (laughs) reading some old books, kind of, I think, predating the 1960s or 70s or ever when the, the Temple Mount was able to be excavated. You heard, it used to be a common argument against believers' baptism that you hear these people at the Temple and there's no place for them to get baptized. Where would you, how could you baptize 3,000 people at the Temple? So clearly it was pouring. You can do, you know, cups uh, and pour water in your head anywhere. But now that they've excavated much of the, the Temple Mount, you can go there and there are mikvahs everywhere, everywhere. And this is what the the Jews would often do is they, before they did a religious ritual, they would go through a kind of ritual purification. The mikvahs were immersion. The Jews, I think, had a lot of superstitions about that, that the the water had to touch every part of their body or they weren't uh, purified. Baptisms then, uh, especially in the early church, didn't happen. You know, it wasn't a person who lowered you in the water. You went in yourself. You were demonstrating that you were being baptized of your own accord. Nobody was forcing you. Nobody, the Jews, some of the Jews had this superstition that if somebody's hand touched you while you were being, uh, being, going under the water, that part of you wasn't clean. That part of you wasn't purified. A very um, superstitious kind of behavior. Well, they're everywhere there. And so thousands of people are responding to the preaching of the word. And of course, it would be natural for them to be, and the word here is baptized, but the word means immersed. The word baptizo means to immerse, immerse something or someone. And that's what happens here. They're immersed, likely in the mikvahs, to demonstrate they are now part of the church. This is the door to church. This is the stepping stone from kind of affiliating with the church on the outside to becoming a member of the church. And let me just pause real quick and say that I'm, I'm sure in a room this size, there are people here that would say that they're Christians. And I mean, I know how it happens. You're invited to church by friends or made to come by a parent, perhaps. <laughs> and then over time, you, you just believe the message. And then a year gives way to another year and gives way to another year. And then you're, you know, you've been in church for four or five years. And you would say you're a Christian and you would say you're following the Lord. Uh, but baptism, I mean, that's up there. And there's like, 
Everybody's looking at you <laughs> and you get wet and that messes up your hair. It's kind of weird and embarrassing and you're standing in front of everybody. So why would I have to do that? Why can't I just keep coming to church? Because that's the demonstration that you're going from being an observer and into being a participant, that you're going from being a spectator to, to being a believer. That's what baptism demonstrates. So that is the first mark of a, a true church. For someone to be part of the church, they have to be baptized. They have to be baptized. And this is not circumcision, by the way. Baptism did not, um, circumcision didn't evolve into baptism or become baptism. Circumcision, if you remember, comes from the Old Testament, Genesis 17, where God gives Abraham the Abrahamic covenant and then institutes circumcision as the sign of that covenant. So circumcision was not something that was um, commemorating the new covenant, although it certainly had some symbolism that pointed towards the new covenant, but circumcision was not initially connected to the new covenant. It was connected to the Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 17 is very clear about that. As a sign of the covenant, God tells Abraham, you will be circumcised. And it was a particular sign for the Abrahamic covenant because the Abrahamic covenant was the promise that the seed would come from Abraham. The seed would be the savior who would crush the head of Satan and undo the devil's working in this world and usher in worship of the true God. I mean, that's what the, the covenant was about. It began, of course, with uh, Adam and Eve after uh, Abel was killed. There was a promise to them that they would have a child who would be the offspring, who would crush the head of Satan at the fall. And then Abel, of course, was murdered and they thought it would be Seth. They even named Seth. The word Seth means seed. It wasn't Seth, though. And there's this, this wondering who will be the savior. And circumcision comes in the world to say the savior will come through Abraham. He will come through the nation of Israel. So it's a very, it's an ethnic mark and starting with Abraham. And so everybody who circumcised is passing along the seed. It's only for the men because the men are passing along the seed. That's the idea behind this. It's, it's full of the ethnic implications. It's an ethnic hope. Now, part of it is a longing for a new covenant. Of course, Deuteronomy chapter 10 foreshadowed this. Moses, in you know, his farewell sermon to the Israelites is kind of rebuking them because remember, he doesn't get to go to the promised land and he blames them for it because they were wicked and rebellious and made him hit the rock. You know, he's doing some blame shifting here. But in his rebuke of them, he says, the day is coming when the Lord isn't going to be content just to circumcise you, but will circumcise your hearts. This is Deuteronomy chapter 10. Jeremiah 9 points forward to that. Jeremiah 9 verse 25. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will punish those, all those who are, all those who are circumcised merely in the flesh. So God is rebuking the Israelites, saying, you are stubborn. You're keeping the sign of the covenant. The, the problem with the Israelites is, is nothing to do with circumcision. They practice circumcision just, just fine. But it was an, that's a mark on the flesh. It doesn't produce, have spiritual benefit or value to it, other than an indication that you are part of the, the national, the ethnic group of people that are longing for the Savior, the Messiah to come. That's ostensibly what it was representing. So baptism doesn't really replace that in that sense. You know, the regeneration of the heart, I think, is what replaces circumcision. Regeneration is the new heart. The, the, old, the flesh is pulled away in the heart, and you're saved in that sense. And that's what happens. Baptism is the demonstration of the circumcised heart. It's not just for men. It's for men and women. It's not a sign of future faith and hope. It's a public declaration that you heard the preaching of the word and you believed. That's what baptism represents. You believed it. Not that you will believe it one day. Circumcision happened to the children. It happened to the, you know, the seventh, eighth day is when circumcision happened because it's pointing forward. It wasn't dependent upon faith. The Abrahamic covenant wasn't dependent upon faith of those who received circumcision. There's a difference between true Israel and false Israel. Circumcision represented all even of false Israel. And that's not what baptism does. Baptism doesn't represent both true and false church members. Baptism represents that you have made a profession of faith and you're identifying yourself with the local church. So I know how it happens. You come to church and you just don't want to get baptized because years go by. But I would say, like, just do it. <laughs> you place your faith in Christ. It's your time to stand before the congregation and say, I, I want to identify with the church. I want to identify by being baptized. I would say if you're baptized as an infant, you should be baptized as a believer because the baptism as an infant uh, is not representing your own faith. It's not your own affiliation or with the church. 
This is why in covenantalism, it's so, so critical for them to have a distinction between the visible church and the invisible church because there's a huge delta there. The visible church has all kinds of non-believers in it because you're added to the church. You become a participant in some form of the new covenant apart from your own individual faith. But I would disagree with that and say baptism is your entrance to the church and it's for those who have had their hearts circumcised, have been regenerated in the flesh and it's the outward expression or demonstration or profession of their conversion. And it is a sign of a church. It is the first sign of the church. It's the first thing the church does in Acts chapter two, baptism. So second sign of the church, leadership, verse 42, 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The people are gathered together and they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. This is a shift from what was happening in Judaism. Judaism had the recognized priestly class. So they had the Sanhedrin, they had the priests, um, they had those that could minister, but in a typical synagogue, the, the reading and the teaching that would happen in the synagogue, it was on a rotating basis kind of thing. This is not the way the church is going to operate. It's not going to rotate through everybody. It's not something you're born into by ethnicity or by your tribe. Um, that's not the way it's going to happen. It's going to be something that you, it's recognized from the church. The church is recognizing that these are the leaders. Now here are the apostles. That's all there are. As you read through the book of Acts, understand the beginning of Acts chapter two is not like the instruction manual for how to do church as much as it's descriptive of what they were doing. That's why it's so helpful for this kind of sermon because it's describing what the early church was like. But as you work your way through the book of Acts and in the pastoral epistles, you get the prescriptive, like this is what you're supposed to do. So in light of the description early in Acts that they had apostles, they had leaders teaching them, Apostles don't live forever. They die, some of them before others. And as they're dying out, who replaces them? What's the leadership structure of the church? It's not going to be their descendants. There's not an apostolic office that new people will fill in. The apostles give way to elders in the church. That becomes the New Testament model. That's how you see it played out through the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 says it this way, he gave some being God gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints to the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So God is gifting, this is in the context of Ephesians 4 of spiritual gifts, God through his Holy Spirit is gifting the church with some of these people. Pastors here is a word for, for shepherd, someone who cares for the flock. First Timothy 3 gives qualifications for them. So does Titus chapter 1. The idea is that these are people who are leading the church. They have some form of authority in the church that you see described in Hebrews 13. They're keeping watch over your souls, Paul says. That's the leadership in the church. A church has baptism that marks your entrance to it, and then it has an authority structure of pastors and elders who are shepherding the congregation. The point in Acts chapter 2 is not so much what they're called, rather the fact that godly qualified men were the leaders and the teachers in the congregation. They were the one doing the teaching. They were the ones recognized as leading the church. A church without elders is a group of people meeting together. A plane without a pilot hopefully is parked. A group of Christians gathering together, I encourage that. I encourage fellowship. I encourage Bible studies. I encourage you getting together with your friends at Starbucks or in your house or whatever. The more Bible studies, the better. Amen? But that's not church. Church has elders and leadership. The leadership of the church is recognized by the church where the elders look at the lives of people who want to be elders and examine them and say, these people are functioning like elders. They have the qualifications of elders. We identify them as elders. And the elders watch over the flock. This is seen all through the book of Acts, by the way, and the rest of the New Testament. Wherever Paul goes to a place, he establishes elders there. Even the book of Acts, he goes to Ephesus and labors in Ephesus. And when he leaves them, you know, a tearful scene in the book of Acts, Paul's weeping over the church at Ephesus as he hands them off to the elders. And he gives strict charge to the elders to keep watch over the flock. The elders are the teachers. They're the ones who, who set the tone, who guard the flock. They feed the flock. They shepherd the flock. They're the essential, an essential part of the church. They don't 
They're not the tribes. They're not the 12 tribes of Israel. This is why I want, just want you to appreciate that the church is new. There's, this is concept is not in the Old Testament. Do you understand that? Moses didn't have this, this concept. He had the tribes and the tribes had representatives and they appointed other representatives and that was a way to dispense communication. That was not how Israel was led. And those leaders were not shepherding the people. This is the lament over and over again in the Old Testament. They had no shepherds. In the New Testament, it's not like that. Paul tells Titus, you appoint elders in every in every city. And Titus is, you know, in Crete. And Paul tells, uh, Crete is a new church. They're immature. They're liars and gluttons and lazy people. And, you know, it, it's not a healthy place. But people are getting saved. And Titus is looking around saying, I don't see any of these people as elder qualified. And Paul tells Titus, oh, it's okay. They don't really need elders then. No, he doesn't say that. Paul tells Titus, find the godliest dudes you can. Okay, if they're all down here, find the ones that are at the top of down there and make them the elders. Do something. Because the church needs elders. You can see the godliness of a church by the godliness of its elders. I believe that's true. You can see the maturity of a church by the maturity of its elders. The sobriety of a church by the sobriety of the elders. I mean, they're setting the tone. The prayerfulness of the church by the prayerfulness of the elders. They're an essential part of the church. And so, as I mentioned, the elders are not priests. They're leaders. They're not the priests of the church. They're not the prophets of the church. They are the leaders and the shepherds of the church. Psalm 23 gives you a contrast. In the Old Testament, the shepherd of the people was Yahweh. He was the shepherd of the sheep. Not much is clear. Then you get to Ezekiel 34, where Yahweh laments that the leaders of Israel are bad shepherds. They're fleecing the sheep and eating them. They're supposed to guard the sheep, Ezekiel 34 says. Instead, the shepherds are exploiting them, profiting off of them. They're not feeding them, and then they're slaughtering them. And Ezekiel 34, God calls those false shepherds to repent, to put their faith in God. It's a pretty basic requirement. If you're going to be a shepherd, you need to feed the sheep. There's not a lot on the shepherd's to-do list. Shepherd wakes up in the morning, count the sheep, get them food, get them water, don't let the wolves get them. So it's a pretty short list. I'm sure it's very difficult and more complicated than that. But the bottom line is you have to feed the sheep. The shepherds, so-called shepherds in the Old Testament, were not feeding the sheep. They were rebuked by God. Ezekiel 34, God says, I'm going to cut them off. Then I'm going to come as their true shepherd. Jesus identifies himself that way. When he comes in in John, he says that he is the shepherd of the sheep. John chapter 10, he proclaims himself to be the good shepherd. He will lay his life down for the sheep. He is the true shepherd. He's the shepherd prophesied in Ezekiel 34. The shepherd prophesied in Psalm 23. He's it. So if it ended there, that would be pretty strong continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament laments the lack of a shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd, fulfilling the shepherd motif, period. Let's go home. But that's not where it ends. The New Testament picks up that shepherding motif and doesn't find it located ultimately and finally in Jesus, but finds the shepherding of Jesus manifested and displayed in the church through the pastors and elders. The word pastor just means shepherd. And it's played out through the rest of the New Testament. The elders are called shepherds or pastors. Paul calls them pastors. First Timothy 5, Peter refers to them as, as pastors. He says, I exhort the elders among you. This is First Peter 5 verse 1. As a fellow elder and the witness of the sufferings of Christ, as a partaker of the glory that's going to be revealed, shepherd or pastor the flock of God that's among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. Don't do it for money, but do it because you want to. And don't be a, a jerk about it. And he says, not domineering those under your charge, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. So the New Testament is seeing the shepherd metaphor expanded. So Old Testament, Yahweh is a shepherd. The Israelites, bad shepherds. God comes, true shepherd, lays his life down. Jesus dies on the cross as the true shepherd of the sheep, resurrects, ascends to heaven where he dwells at this moment. And he doesn't leave us as sheep without a shepherd. That's how the end of Zechariah ends. Remember, the shepherd will be struck. The sheep will scatter. That happens. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the shepherd is struck, ultimately crucified, ascends to heaven. Sheep are not scattered, though, because the Holy Spirit binds us together. And then God raises up shepherds from the midst of the congregation to watch over them. That's a new covenant reality. The elders do not replace Levites. There's the priest of all believers. Every believer is a priest in that sense. Jesus is the high priest. That's not the metaphor here. This is a new thing. This concept doesn't really function in the Old Testament, except negatively. In the New Testament, this should be normal for, it shouldn't be an exception that a church has godly men as elders. It should be normal 
Christian New Covenant Church. So the two churches, baptism, leadership. These next ones are just going to have to go faster. That's the bottom line. Third mark of a true church, doctrine. Doctrine. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Every church has, and this word teaching here could also be rendered doctrine. Every church has doctrine. Here in the book of Acts, the very first church gathering, this is what they're, this is what they're about. They're coming together. Think of kind of the, what a contrast this is. This is kind of some kind of the cheesy advertisements for uh, cheesy churches. <laughs> You know, we're here a place for authentic life where we just, you can be transparent and authentic and authentic and transparent. And, you know, the most important thing at this church is come as you are. That's what, it's really important is that you come as you are so we can live authentic lives one with another. Um, what a contrast with Acts chapter two. And the church didn't come to uh, come as you are. That's not, that's not what bound them together. The church came to be devoted to the doctrine of the apostles, the apostles' teaching. And you're going to see that played out all through the book of Acts. This is the command for elders to guard their lives and their doctrine. Now, this exists in some sense. Uh, the churches that are gathered together here, they don't have the apostles, or they don't have the gospels yet. They're not studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They don't have those. haven't been written. By Acts chapter 2, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have not been written yet. Instead, they have the men who heard those sermons. They have the men who heard Jesus' preaching. And so they're gathered together to listen to them. But as the New Testament begin to be written, you see this shift start to happen away from the apostles' teaching, as, from their own lips, and into faithful people who were entrusted by the apostles to teach the word of God. Do you see that change? So instead of it just being you gather around Peter's feet and say, hey, tell us that one time where, you know, tell us about when Jesus said he was the true shepherd and Jesus would teach on that. That's going to give way to John writing his gospel and now Paul telling Timothy and others, you raise up people that can take Luke's gospel and Timothy's example. He's, uh, he, Paul is telling Timothy, take somebody, train somebody to take Luke's gospel and be able to teach that. Because you don't have the apostles with you. They're dying. So you need men that can teach the word and develop doctrine from that. The scripture is being written. That's how this devotion turned. It turned away from the apostles into the word of God. You see this described somewhat in 2 Timothy 4. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who's going to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom. And I just want you to just marvel at 2 Timothy 4 verse 1. It's one of those just fantastic lines in the Bible. You know, the Bible, nothing in the Bible needs an intro like that. Paul can just say something and it's true. So he, verse one is totally unnecessary. You don't need any of that. And yet he writes it there to show you what's happening in verse two is like extra special. Pay close attention to this. And then he underlines it. I mean, just count how many ways. He doesn't just say, I charge you. He says, which he does say, I charge you. But he says, I solemnly charge you. That's a twofold charge. In the presence of God. I mean, that makes it triple important. And the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. It's a fourfold importance right there. Who's going to judge the living. I mean, this is, he doesn't need to say that. It's, it's five little things he's adding. Oh, and he's going to judge the dead. That's the sixth thing. And by his appearing, that's the seventh. And by his kingdom. So there's eight little admonitions here that are leading you into the charge. And the charge is preach the word. For elders and pastors to preach the word, to be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, great patience and instruction. This is what binds the church together. If you're familiar with 2 Timothy, Paul's about to, after that, lament how people in his day are not clinging to the word of God. They're finding teachers that tickle their ears. In contrast, Timothy should preach the word in season and out of season. Paul tells the Corinthians, for this reason I sent Timothy to you, who's my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways, which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. So that's, you see the, the handoff happening here. Paul was discipled by the apostles. Paul becomes, in the sense, an apostle sent to the Gentiles. He's training up Timothy. He gives Timothy Luke's gospel. Timothy takes Luke's gospel. He begins teaching it. Paul tells Timothy, you're going to go around to the Corinthians. I mean, these guys are hopeless. Go to them. <laughs> Spend time with them everywhere in every church. And I could put another dozen verses in the screen about this, but I won't. The point is that a true church is devoted to doctrine. It has a statement of faith. It has expressly worded and well-reasoned propositions about what the church believes. The leadership labors over the doctrine and that's what's presented to the world. And the church believes it. And the church without doctrine is not a church. So again, a group of Christians being together at Starbucks. 
Even if they were to grab baptism, great. And even if they were to appoint an elder, great. Still, they need doctrine. You need to have what you're gathered around, what defines you doctrinally. Fourth, a true church has fellowship. They have the teaching and they have the fellowship. Um, if Jesus is the head of the church and the doctrine is the bones of the church and the believers are the body of the church, then fellowship is the life of the church. So Jesus is our head. The church is a structure to it. And the fellowship of the church is what gives that structure life. If you want to make a new friend, you can't go into the mall and befriend a mannequin. The mannequin won't talk back. <laughs> and for a while, the mannequin might be a good listener to you. But eventually, you're going to want to hear something in exchange, and the mannequin won't do it. A body in a morgue, not a good friend. And not alive. A church without fellowship is a dead church. A church without people who, who, who love each other and care for one another is a dead church. And this is one difference between a, a university class on religion and a church. You can take a university class on religion, at Liberty, go to a, a good school that has a religion class and you can go there and the guy teaching the class might be elder qualified and the people in the class might be baptized and Liberty might have a statement of faith, but it's not this kind of church body fellowship that you have there. A church is different than a Bible class. There's a love and a preference for one another over each other. And it's supernatural because the people in the church are not, you know, in a Bible class, the people are generally the same age. Not in a church. You guys are all looking out here. You guys are all different ages. You're all over the map out here. I'm not going to point or anything, but it's, it's all over the map. You guys are all different ethnicities and different income levels and you live in different places. It's, you don't have, yeah, for the most part, you guys don't have anything in common except the Lord and the Lord Binds you together in this church. That's what you have in common. If you guys just sat next to each other in an airplane, you've, you likely wouldn't even be friends. But because you have a common faith expressed through a common church, there's life in the church. And this is so hard in big churches, which is why you're all here at Sunday night, and I love it so bad. You know, the bigger the church is, the smaller it has to feel. The more people that are at church, the smaller it has to be. And now there's some people say, I can only go to a small church. So you'd have a problem then because Acts chapter two, it's got 3,000 people. The first day they're together, they're bigger than IBC is. It's not really about the size of the church, but it's about the fellowship of the church. A church of 100 can't break into groups of 40 or 20 or 10 without seeming cliquish. But this is why I like, I like a bigger, I like a church the size of IBC because we can break into groups without seeming cliquish. We can't have ABFs that are different life stages and it doesn't seem cliquish because the church is big enough to do that and have real fellowship in real life. And you see that all over the New Testament. The New Testament fills this out with life on life discipleship. And then I hope you see that it's all supernatural. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that does that, that does that. And I'd encourage you, if you have a hard time developing relationships in the, the church, you know, there's not an ABF that meets your preferred demographic or whatever, uh, that you would just strive to be, be friends with people in the church, strive to make relationships with those in the church as best you're able. And I think people gen generally reciprocate that. And that helps you have this life on life fellowship that's in the church. It's described here, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, right out the gate. Number five, a true church has communion. The breaking of bread, it says in verse 42, they're fellowshipping one to another. A true church practices communion. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we do communion often here and I you know, try to talk about a different element just about every time we do it. But every church should practice communion. It is a form of fellowship. It's a public demonstration of us being united together because there's one bread and there's one cup and we all participate in that. We take together at the same time. So, you know, in a sense, communion takes the place of Passover differently than baptism and circumcision relate. I'm saying that uh, the communion is different than that. But communion does take, in a sense, the fulfillment of Passover. Passover was pointing backwards to how God led them out of Egypt. So you slaughtered the lamb, blood on the doorpost. God passes over your house. That's why it's called Passover. God leads them across the Red Sea into the wilderness. They're supposed to celebrate Passover while they're in the wilderness as they're looking forward uh, ahead. They get to the promised land. Deuteronomy says, Deuteronomy 16, I believe, says when you enter the promised land, you may not pass, celebrate Passover wherever you want to. It will be localized in one spot. You only will celebrate Passover in the city where the Lord chooses to set his name. Speaking of Jerusalem, that's where you'll celebrate Passover. So it had a very forward-looking element to it. They're wondering, where is this going to be? Where will we celebrate Passover? Where will we keep it? 
And celebrating in Jerusalem is, of course, preparing the way for Jesus to come. And, and by, by Deuteronomy 16, what had already happened is Abraham had already offered Isaac on that same mountain, by the way. Uh, Isaac had already been offered. God stopped the blade. God would provide the sacrifice. God uh, spared Isaac's life. So it's already in God's mind. God has already picked the real estate where this will go down. Now they're about to cross in the promised land. You don't get to pass over, celebrate Passover anywhere. It's got to be in Jerusalem because it's setting up Christ so that Jesus can go and he can be the final Passover lamb. So it's looking forward to Jesus, looking backwards to the flight from Egypt, looking forward to Jesus. That's all in view here. Communion eclipses that in a sense. Jesus celebrates the last Passover, says, I won't celebrate this anymore until I'm in my kingdom, looking forward to the kingdom. You, however, as the church, will celebrate communion. So church doesn't celebrate Passover. We celebrate communion. We take the bread, we take the wine. We have that kind of fellowship together, pointing backwards to Jesus' death. We talk about his body and his, his blood and pointing forward to the returning of Christ. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So communion has that twofold dynamic as well. Looking backwards to Jesus' death, looking forward to his return. Every time we celebrate it, we should do this often, Paul says. Now, again, Acts 2 here is descriptive, not prescriptive. So it seems that you read Acts 2 verse 42, it's just described as the breaking of bread. It was likely more like some kind of meal. But by the growth of the church and by the time you get to the epistles, it seems to have settled into something much more like what we do at Emmanuel. That's what a true church does. It has that kind of fellowship and vibrancy and communion to it as an outgrowth of that fellowship. True church is prayer. This is where verse 42 ends. Uh, and the prayers. A church is devoted to prayer because they recognize that God is at work supernaturally. This is a, a key point. The church functions through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's a supernatural entity. You can't engineer this. You cannot engineer church growth. I mean, you can engineer drawing a crowd and drawing people, but that's not the same thing as drawing a church. And I hope you all I'll know that. You can do things at a church to increase, you know, numbers and attendance. You can give away you know, cars if you want. Oprah style church growth ministry right there. But that's not a church. You can draw a crowd. There's ways to draw a crowd. That's not drawing a church. The Lord is the one who builds the church. He determines who's part of a church. He's the one that brings people to church. The Lord is sovereign over who is at a church. The Lord's sovereign over which churches grow and which churches don't, over the size of a church, why some churches are big and some churches are small. It's entirely the Lord's work, not ours. We can't engineer that. And part of a church being devoted to prayer is the confession of that, that you pray confessing, this is God who builds the church, not, not us. We do the work of the ministry, of course, but it's the Lord who is working through us. It's all his sovereignty. So prayer marks a church. Prayer is what distinct, every Christian prays, but when a church is marked by prayer, that's what distinguishes it from like a religious organization or business that we recognize what we're doing here is supernatural, fueled by the Lord. And that's going to be played out all through the book of Acts. You know, the book of Acts is one supernatural story after another. As the church gathers, they're marked by these things. They're marked by prayer as well. I mean, by worship as well. A true church is going to gather together and worship. You see this in verse 43. Awe comes upon every soul. Wonders and signs are being done to the apostles. And uh, I don't think that is something that's repeatable because we're not apostles. Remember, they die off. But all who believed were together. Had they all had things in common, they're generous towards one another. Just look at all the happy words in verse 45. They were selling their possessions and belonging, distributing to everybody who had need, day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, receiving their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. I mean, I could have made this list much longer going through that. I mean, the church is meeting each other's needs. They're generous. Nobody's starving in the church because they're sharing all their possessions. And that should be true on a global scale. I know at IBC, we don't have people that are starving necessarily. And if you are, come talk to us because we have food. But like on a global scale, there's churches in poorer areas that are struggling and we send them money and we send them food and we work there to, to so the body of Christ cares for itself. And that's what's happening in Acts 2. They're meeting each other's needs. I've talked a lot about that before, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. But the gist of all this, they're meeting each other's needs, selling things, but they're happy. They're glad. I mean, that's unusual. Like, here's my stuff. I'm giving it away, and I'm so happy to do it. That's supernatural and unusual. And then verse 47, they're praising God. They're just worshiping. 
They praise the Lord through all this. The apostles are doing signs and wonders. They're giving away their things. They're being baptized. They're having communion. They're studying the doctrine of the Old Testament, which is going to give way to the New Testament. They're raising up elders from the congregation. I mean, this is a busy, busy time. And the defining word of all of it, I think, is just worship. Verse 47, they are praising God. They're worshiping. And when you have all those things together, When you have baptism and leadership, elders and doctrine and fellowship, communion and prayer and worship, the end of verse 47 should be true. The Lord's adding to their number day by day those who are being saved. I mean, that has been true for 2,000 years. The apostles died out, but the church didn't die out. The people that were reading about in Acts chapter 2, those 3,000, they died out, but the church didn't die out. God keeps adding numbers to the church. God keeps growing the church. And this church had met publicly before. uh, You see that in Acts chapter 3. They were meeting in the portico, the the footsteps of the temple, a massive place to seat thousands of people. That's where the church was meeting. And during the week, they'd go into each other's homes. They would get together to worship and celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Persecution is going to come. They're going to flee. But this is the first generation church, the Lord giving the growth. And you see how they fought and you see how they were persecuted through the book of Acts and how they passed down the gospel to the next generation. And the next generation received it. Paul handed it to Titus. He ran with it. The third generation received it. By the time Jesus writes to his churches in the book of Revelation, 50 years later, I mean, you're generation after generation, just inside of the New Testament. We take for granted at Emmanuel Bible Church so many of the blessings the Lord has given us. I mean, think of that, just looking at Oakwood School, driving by it. God has blessed us with elders that devoted themselves to doctrine and made our our doctrinal statement. They raised up a massive number of elders at our church that are godly men. And it gets passed along to the next generation. And the church grows. This is the Lord blessing it. And I want to, you know, we can sometimes complain or grumble about parking and have to take the shuttle across or, you know, I don't like that music stuff. When's band Sunday again? But he recognize just the incredible effort and intensity that goes through these things to give us the kind of church that we have right now. I'm so grateful for the, the Lord to it. My main point in addressing this tonight is just to try to draw out to you that list of things on the board. I mean, some of them are true in the Old Testament. The Old Testament should have been marked by worship. There was a kind of fellowship in the Psalms of Ascent as the people sang coming back from exile. But for the most part, you look at this and you you see what's happened in Acts 2 and nothing like this ever happened before. There's never a group of people in the Bible that were knit together through baptism, raising up elders and developing their own doctrinal kind of statement and communion. Of course, this has never happened before. And yet it becomes normative for the church. It's what every church should be like. Praise God that we have a church like this. Lord, we're grateful for your word. We don't want to lose sight of the fact of Jesus Christ who is crucified and resurrected on our behalf. This is why we sing. It's why we studied the word. It's why the early church was gathered together. It was the content of Peter's preaching in the sermon that the Savior would suffer and die and resurrect. That David's tent would fall and then be raised again. The Holy Spirit would come and bring judgment on Israel and yet graft in the Gentiles and launch the church. So we receive that. We don't look at this and exalt ourselves over the the Jews or over the Old Testament. We don't receive this even and say there's two peoples of God or anything like that. We receive this with gratitude knowing that you have caused every generation from Adam forward to have people in it of faith who believe your word. Even when those people were few, eight on a boat at one point, even when they were few, you kept yourself alive. You always had the knees of those who didn't bow to Baal. You had your people in every generation. But now, Lord, you have caused the, the flood banks to break. He says, burst forth into the world. The gospel has gone global. There's churches everywhere. We relish in the newness of it, even though we're in year 2000 of it. We relish the newness of it, the novelty of it in redemptive history, the 
the wonderful design that you're the architect and you built a place like this. This is your plan and we're grateful for it. We're happy to be participants of it. We pray for courage as we take the gospel to the world. As we proclaim the death and resurrection of Christ through our congregation, gather to the songs we sing. We pray that you would be magnified in it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I do want to take a few minutes, uh, maybe four or five minutes to answer any questions you guys have before we sing our closing song on this sermon or on any of the others as we've gone through uh, this heading. I know I preached for a little bit of a longer time tonight than maybe I was expecting or maybe you were expecting. <laughs> but I do want to give a few minutes if you have any questions before we uh, close our song. Yeah. So in uh, Mark Dever's book, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church, right, which is pretty close to your <laughs> list, I think. Yeah, so I have said that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, so but I was curious, like, so he, he, he includes evangelism and church discipline, right, in his list. I want to make a comment, like, where do those marks, or where do those fall, like, in your mind, in terms of what's a true church? Yeah, so I, I do love the Nine Marks of Healthy Church book and curriculum, and I think, I think it's great. Um, the, those two things I don't see necessarily in, act, in Acts 2. You're going to see evangelism in Acts 3, though, as they go out. Uh, you're going to see church discipline in Acts 5. So they're there. If I just can find myself to this, to this passage, though, um, then that's what I got. But I, w- I would certainly see those as part of a church, um, certainly part of a healthy church. Um, there's a lot of churches that don't practice church discipline. I think they do that to their, own, to their own detriment. I think a church that doesn't evangelize is missing its calling as well. I would also be careful, though, and I would, make a, I would quibble with something about evangelism. A healthy church equips the saints to do the work of the ministry. So church doesn't exist for evangelism. The congregation gathered is not for evangelism. So the congregation gathered is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. So, and that's, there's a philosophy of ministry thing there. You, you know, you don't structure a worship service for non-Christians. So you don't ask yourself like, what kind of songs do non-believers want to hear? What kind of teaching do non-believers want to hear? What kind of seats do non-believers want to sit in? You don't want to make a church comfortable for non-believers because that's not who your target audience is. Your target audience is Christians who want to be equipped to do the work of the ministry as they scatter. So that would be the one slight quibble. I think Dever is with me on that. I mean, having been to Capitol Hill Baptist, I know he's with me on that one. Um, Their pews don't even have cushions. Other question? Yeah. I like how in all of the different points that you hit, you kind of highlighted the differences between how the Jews functioned in the Old Covenant versus how the Christians functioned in in the New Covenant. Um, But on the point of fellowship, I feel like, can can you just expand on how you think the Jews and the Christians differ? Between Jews and Christians in Old Covenant, New Covenant fellowship. So fellowship in the New Covenant is going to be richer, more vibrant, and transcendent. Uh, so much of the Old Covenant is ethnic. It is external. And their fellowship was around. Even the Psalms of Ascent, which I think have wonderful depictions of fellowship. Wonderful. Uh, like how sweet the fellowship of the brothers, like dew coming down the mountain kind of thing. Like there's just real vivid pictures of fellowship in the Psalms of Ascent. Yet when we think carefully about it, what is binding them together? It's, it's the journey. It's the pilgrimage to the temple, to Zion. Um, And that's different. You know, our fellowship at a church is not the shuttle ride to the church. Our fellowship to the church is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fact that the Holy Spirit indwells us all. So, you know, Psalm, was it 130, talks about the, of one of the Psalms of Ascent, talks about the unity that the church, or that the Israel had through the pilgrimage. So I would say the church has a richer unity described in Ephesians for through the indwelling of the, of the Holy Spirit. So similar, but deeper and more profound. That's a great question. And maybe one more question. Yeah, in the back. Oh, me? I yeah. just, <laughs> um, it, it seems like in America we have a debate over covenantalism versus dispensationalism. Yeah. There was a, when I was in Europe, there was a real sensitivity to it, um, to covenantalism as being anti-Semitic. Have you ever bumped into that? And is it just because yeah. it's saying that, you know, no, no more is there Israel, it's now the church instead of this parallel thing? Yeah, so Europe has its own dynamics at play on both sides of this. You know, dispensationalists in Europe are often associated with the, the Anabaptists and the um, more like the Plymouth Brethren who were, who were severely persecuted, uh, the Mennonites and so forth. And 
Um, the covenantalists there are often associated with more, especially in mainland Europe, with more of Lutheranism and the line there, and which often gets accused of being anti-Semitic. Luther, of course, had his tirades against the Jews and, and all that. Um, so... Yeah, yeah, I would. Anti Semitic, but I, d I would say this that dispensationalism doesn't, it's harder to arrive at dispensationalism in a world without Israel. And so much of covenantalism, I know dispensationalism is self developed in the 1800s, but it didn't really take off until the 1900s where you have Israel because you just have some basic questions. Is God going to bless the nations? Yes. Is one of those nations going to be Israel? And if the answer is yes, that's the lead. you're already well on your way to dispensationalism at that point. And so there is, a, there is a semblance in some covenantalism that would say that Israel is kind of obsolete. And it has an anti-Semitic uh, vibe to it, that there is no future promises for Israel. Even I've even heard some covenantalist pastors in the United States say that there is no such thing really as Judaism anymore. There's no Jews. The Jews were all uh, bred out of existence to the exile. European Jews are more German than Jewish. There's no such thing as Judaism. What they speak now is even Hebrew. You know, it's, it's Yiddish. It's, I've heard those speeches from covenantalist pastors that strike me as anti-Semitic. I know they don't mean it that way, but it's very easy to hear it that way. I also know that in uh, the Middle East, especially in Israel, um, but even in some parts of, of Lebanon and Jordan, uh, some of the strongest uh, evangelical remnants there are dispensational, are premillennial, um, which is just fascinating to think. You have Arabs that, are, uh, that themselves would generally tend to be anti-Semitic that come encounter the Bible and recognize there is going to be a future for Israel and the Savior is going to come back and reign there. So it's really fascinating to meet like, you know, Arab or Palestinian premillennialist dispensationalists. It's like, Incredible. Um, the, only, the only study Bible in Arabic is the MacArthur Study Bible. I mean, that's, that's what you got. If you're an Arab reading believer, that, that's, that's what you got your hands on. Um, so you're looking forward to Israel. Uh, all right, and then last question, because you had your hand up fast. A question about the distinction of the church and the discontinuity. Uh, that this is not one people, there's distinct people. But when we get to Revelation and we see the bride of Christ, uh, some people say that is the church. But at some point, the Old Testament saints have to merge into the holy ones? Or, or how would we describe that, yeah. that scene at the end? Yeah, yeah so I'm not, I'm not a fan of, I know some of the earlier dispensationalists use the kind of language of two brides so to speak. I'm not a fan of that kind of language. Um, the church is called the bride of Christ uh, and in Ephesians. But I think there's some, a, a continuity in that sense of people that have placed their faith in, uh, in God throughout the ages. You see this, I see this at the end of Hebrews 11, that apart from us, they wouldn't be made perfect. So they're expecting something. They're still they haven't had their bodily resurrection yet. Old covenant saints have not been physically bodily resurrected uh, in that sense. Um, and they will be when the rapture happens. They will be when the graves open up and then we will all be kind of one, I would take it as one, as one body at that point. Um, so I would maybe see more continuity there than maybe some other people might be comfortable with. That's a good question. All right, let me invite you to stand. Let's close our time tonight singing uh, about the wonderful cross of Jesus Christ. And then JJ will send us away with the benediction. I, I find it interesting. I was just looking a little earlier in Acts 2 that Right before this, um, this beautiful fellowship and uh, prayer and worship uh, of the church, uh, you see a group of uh, people cut to the heart by the gospel, the gospel of Christ crucified. And, and Jesus said in John 13 that uh, like a seed that dies, he'd bear much fruit, that his death would bear fruit. And so uh, how appropriate, I think, to finish singing about the wonderful cross uh, where Jesus died and in that death uh, gave us life. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the
righteous king I count but lost and poor contempt on all my pride forbid it Lord that I should my God all the vain things that charm me most I sacrifice them to his love see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow me go down. Did air such love and sorrow? God displayed in the cross is in fact so amazing and so divine and uh, Jesse thank you so much uh, for uh, the sermon tonight and I'm just so thankful to be at this church it is such a blessing to be at a church that preaches the word of God uh, and um, it's just amazing to see how God blesses the preaching of his word and enriches the fellowship at this church so uh, go even now you have 11 minutes before Awana is out and enjoy that sweet fellowship Encourage one another and pray for one another. Have a good week. And now, for a parting word from Pastor Jesse Johnson. Thanks for joining us. If you're in the Washington, D.C. area, I would love to see you at Emmanuel Bible Church. For more information on our church or our current service times, go to ibc.church. For more information about the Master Seminary and their Washington, D.C. location, go to tms.edu. I hope this resource has been a blessing to you and it helps you seek the Lord daily, serve others around you, and share the gospel with boldness.